This is the Seller Process Podcast, where we talk about the best systems, processes, and SOPs for your Amazon business so that you can regain control of your time, build up your team, and scale your e-com empire. Hello, entrepreneurs. If you are looking for new channels to expand your business and create a household brand by entering big box stores and retail chains, then this episode is for you. Our guest today will share with us the process to turn your e-commerce business into a retail-ready brand so that you can wholesale your products to offline buyers and retail stores. Today, we're joined by Taylor Offer. He has been selling products offline to retailers, to retailers and specialty stores in the USA since 2003. During the years, he sold to over 60 different retailers across the USA, continuing to sell his own brands and also helping various sellers to move from online to offline expanding sales channels. Hey, Tyler, thank you for being here. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for having me today, Gianmarco. It's my pleasure to be with you here. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So I'm excited about this talk today because actually it comes in very timely, you know, in my journey because I'm actually, you know, working on expanding to offline stores. Uh, I think it, it's a great actually a way to, you know, expand further when whenever you have like some products that are successful. Um, it, it makes sense to, to keep pushing on those products and just trying to spread them out as much as possible in as many channels as possible. So uh, we just mentioned retail ready. It's a word that maybe many people might not be familiar with. So I'd like you to start by giving some context to tell people like, what do you mean by uh, uh, retail ready and why Amazon sellers should care about it? Definitely. So uh, retail ready, let's talk about it. Uh, in short, we'll try and later on, we, we might go into some more details. So uh, when you say retail ready, uh, this is actually a point, the point of view from the retailer side. And we, when we talk about the retailers, we're talking about the teams that we're working with. Now, normally we would, people would think that you're going to work with buyers, but it's not only buyers. It's like um, category managers, and GMO, general merchandise officers, sometimes even sourcing managers. There's a lot of titles, but however you put that, each and every title is, you know, a person at the end of the day is looking at your brand and trying to understand not only what your products are, but also who is the company behind it. Now, as an Amazon seller or e-commerce seller or online seller, Normally, and this is something that I'm seeing all the time, normally uh, people are not aware of how the retail um, works. So they are trying um, to present their products in a way that it seems like sort of a funnel, which means just showing the product, showing what it does, talking about you know what discount you're gonna get or what voucher you're gonna get and pushing it all the way to the sell. While in the retail side, it's a little bit different. How different it is? First of all, visibility and branding is something very, very important in the offline. And why is it so important? The thing is that two points, two main points is number one, not only they expect you to sell them great products that will sell for them on their shelves in their physical stores, but also those retailers are somehow expecting your brand to also push those sales. And how could you push the sales? You can push them by having great branding and by having very good you know, social media traffic. And the combination of a good website and a good you know, uh, packaging and the way the product is presented is what you know, is, a, is a first push for them in terms of sales. The second point that they are looking at is a very important point. They are, there's a lot of Amazon sellers trying you know, to get their hands into the retail to try to communicate with whatever, Home Depot or Costco or all these giant big boxes. And when, when buyers, I would say buyers, but you know, when I say buyers, I mean different titles. But when a buyer is looking at that, is sometimes very quickly identifying that the other side is actually an Amazon seller or just an you know, online seller. And as an online seller, they are a little bit, not to say a lot, 
uh, afraid of how would it work with this company in terms of uh, operational side and logistic side and pricing side and so forth. So even if you have good branding, which is the first two points that I refer to as a written ready, branding is actually made by the website and the catalog. Okay, we'll talk about a catalog later. So even if they define that, <clears throat> They might be afraid that you're not aware of the process with retail and then taking you to this journey for them is going to be, you know, it's going to be rough because at the end of the day, these, these people are mostly working on commission. I mean, yeah, they have their salary and everything, but everyone is waiting for the, you know, um, end of the year commissions and the commissions are based off how many products that this certain team or buyer brought to the shelf that were actually sold. So that's why, you know, if they think that down the road with the process with you as a vendor, taking you as an example, they would have hard time to set you up as a vendor or hard time to work with you with shipping or logistic parts or any other retail parts, which we will talk about. Then they are like, okay, I'm not sure that the products are good, but I'm not sure I want to work with this company because it doesn't look like they understand the business. Okay. It's a very important point. Uh, so it, just to sum it up, so we have the branding, which is the uh, uh, website and catalog. We have the overall looking, which is the packaging. Very important, the packaging, we'll talk about it. Then we have three more points, which we'll talk about it as well, that are research, like researching your comp competitors uh, in the physical stores. Not an easy thing to do. And then from that, you will have to know and understand the pricing because pricing and research are obviously are going together. Because if you see your com competitor selling a product for $45 while you're retailing that product for $50, then it's so it's more or less okay. But if the differences are like 50%, then we have a problem. And next, the last thing is the brief. Brief is a term saying, how am I presenting my products in like four or five sentences. It's the same question if you ask me like, hey, Taylor, how do you define yourself business-wise as a person in short, in like 20 seconds or even 10 seconds? It's the same thing. So those are the six points that retail readiness is built, uh, built from. Awesome, awesome. That's very interesting. Actually, I think most people are not aware of all that you mentioned. You know, we really need to, everything starts from really putting yourself in the shoes of the buyers and understanding their their mindset so that we can basically uh, walk with them, like give them what they are looking for. Uh, that's, that's very great information. Before we dive deep into these six points that you yeah. just mentioned, I'd like you to give some perspective to people in terms of potential. So if they would like, you know, to, to embark in this journey to, to get yeah. into offline retailers, where are the expectation, what they can expect in terms of timing, payment terms and margins, for example, because I think these are some of the important points that people even might have like misconceptions or uh, they're misinformed, right. right? So I love you to, to give some clarity on these points. So I'll take I'll take two um, extreme points of an examples actual examples of brands that I work with, and you can define from that uh, the variety. So in terms of time, how much time it takes to literally have your products on the store in the store on the shelf on the ground wherever it is. The fastest I've seen was last year uh, a vendor from LA selling uh, face care products and she approached me and everything. We started a retail ready process because she wasn't really retail ready. She was halfway uh, ready. And once we've done with that, we started sales. That's what I do. Cause I, you know, normally agents or rep agents would start sales immediately, not even thinking about those points. And that brings to a problem where if you are not retail ready and you're trying to sell it, you're going to run into a wall. So anyway, I'm doing both, like retail readiness, if, if it's needed, and the, the, the sales part. So when we got to the sales part, I think within less than four weeks or three weeks, we've already seen the first three orders, which were overall more than $400,000, which is a, it was a very good start. Now, at the same time, exactly the same time, I started with another brand, which was actually very good, um, you know, overall looking good. And... I thought it's going to be successful and very fast because they have more than 400 SKUs and a very beautiful product, but 
it took almost half a year just to get our foot and start to talk with CVS, which is the biggest pharmacy chain store in, in the States. And until um, we got into almost eight months until we got the first order. Okay, so these are two extreme points. Normally, obviously, somewhere between a few weeks until you start to see responses, you know, because buyers are taking their time and someone is on vacation and the other one is not in office and so forth. But then it depends how hard you push, because as you mentioned in the beginning, I'm working with 60 retailers, but I managed to expand this to almost 100 in the last half year or so I've pushed and I established a new team for sales only for that and everything. But anyway, bottom line is that with that, with that amount of, of, you know, contacts, which is the main thing here, I'm able normally within the first month or two to start seeing movements, get getting POs, sending samples. And you have to keep in mind that you send samples, it takes a few days. The email back and forth is taking another few days. Nobody's not nobody, but most of them would not, you know, be so responsive and so fast. You have to follow up with them. What do you think about the samples I sent? Do you want to move on? What's the pricing? And so on and so on. So, yeah, a few weeks, a month or two would be a normal time to get your, you know, foot in. Okay. Okay, great. What what about margins? Just uh, just to have a perspective, because people are used to maybe say thirty percent to forty percent usually in in e commerce. What about right. wholesale? So so the margins are quite different. But then you're looking at at a volume because when you sell whatever one piece a day or fifty pieces or five hundred pieces, it's not the same when you're looking at an order of let's say hundred thousand pieces, right? You would not expect to make the same profit, not even near to that. So here's like a basic pricing of of wholesale the retail market. You have your MSRP, which is the retail price, basically the price you have on your website and on Amazon. And it's recommended to have the same price on both platforms. Um, Amazon sellers are normally what that's what they do. And then if you look at the wholesale price, so the benchmark would be half of it. Meaning if my product is selling for $50 on my website or on Amazon, I would normally offer it for $23 to $25. Okay, that's a normal price. And then I'll have to look at my costs because if my landed cost, COG, my cost of goods in the warehouse, in LA, New York, wherever it is, my landed cost for the product, let's say is this is the product and it cost me $12 or $8, then I'm good, very good. Why? Because normally a very good profitable business would be when I can double the price for a wholesale price and the wholesale price is going to be doubled again to get the retail price. But this is like a topic. Okay. In, in real life, it doesn't happen too much. What does happen is normally you would buy that certain product for like whatever, uh, uh, 15 or 17 or something, even $20. So then you don't look at, at percentage. You start thinking in different uh, way of approach. You think about a dollar or a cent per piece. So if the order that I'm getting is 20,000 pieces and I'm getting half dollar a piece, then that's nice, but not the best on earth. But if I'm getting only 10,000 pieces and I'm getting $3 each, then it's it's better. So you start playing with, with, with the numbers. And obviously the price, the wholesale price you're selling to Bed Bath & Beyond, which are working on normally 50%, so it's good would not be the same price as you're selling to TJ Maxx because TJ Maxx are working on 25% of the MSRP. So if my price is $50, that means that TJ Maxx would not pay more than $12 to $13 at the max, maybe $14 if they really love the product. So, but TJ Maxx quantities are much far bigger uh, than what Bed Bath & Beyond can, can buy. So Got yeah, it. that's, yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting, and that's actually better than I thought. You know, uh, if you're talking about half of the retail price, or might be less, but still, you know, with uh, bigger volumes, then we're talking about maybe a net margin of I don't know between um, ten to to twenty uh, percent, maybe max. 
uh, something no, like no. that. No, no, you're probably going to make much more than that. For 10% on, on the big volume, it's not, it, it doesn't worth it because you have to keep in mind that there's something very clear on when it comes to retailers, not other channels. Other channels is different, and we will talk about the other channels. But with retailers, traditionally, they would pay you net plus, meaning they get the goods in the warehouse, they ship it to their stores, or you ship it, doesn't matter. And then you have to wait another two, three, or sometimes even six weeks. Mm-hmm. The longest I've seen was net plus 60 days, which is very, very you know hard. But then again, it, it's all a matter of how you negotiate with them. I've seen, and this is something that started in the last two years since we, you know, ran into the situation we are at, that retailers sometimes are willing to pay deposit. And this is something that never happened before. I, I can even tell you more than that. When the, when the chaos started back in March 2020, I've seen cash orders, meaning I shipped after I got payment from, it was TJ Maxx and Burlington and Home Goods that worked that way. Why? Because everybody understood that the market is so unstable right now that nobody wants to take risk. Not them and not me. So they just pay, get the goods and that's it. But again, normally you have to keep in mind that it's net plus something. Now people might think, oh my God, where, where am I going to bring half million dollars from? Forget it. Don't think those with those you know ideas because here's the thing. It's always negotiable. There's always a conversation. Sometimes I'm seeing like them trying to order whatever, 200,000 pieces. And I'm, you know, the vendor says like, I can, I can get you 50,000, not more than that at the moment or at this frame, or I can get you another 50 later or whatever. It's, you know, there's conversation. They just, they don't just drop an order on you and that's it. There are humans behind those emails and phone calls and everything. So, you know, they understand that, you know, there are different situations. So it's very flexible. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, th- those are these are really great insights. Obviously, we're talking a, 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 a um, totally different game. You know, there are diff- totally different uh, volumes here, so it can get really big uh, quite fast, uh, relatively fast. Once you know uh, you you get into different retailers, so that's that's actually a very interesting thing to look at. And also one one uh, quick uh, piece of data I'd like to share with people if if they don't know, um, but. I mean, it's uh, usually lots of people heard about that. E-commerce is just a, a tiny percentage of the whole overall retail uh, that is happening, for example, in the U.S., right? So we're right. sitting at about less than 20% right now in the U.S. So right. so it, meaning that 80% of retail happen offline and just 20% it's, uh, it's online. So uh, this means it's a huge uh, potential for e-commerce to grow but it means that there is like three times four times that you know uh the potential uh going offline so definitely i think it's it's an it's an avenue that every brand should consider once you know they they grow uh a little bit uh on amazon or online right so uh Talar, i'd like to go with you uh on some of these six points that you mentioned to be retail ready we probably won't have the time to cover all of them but let's let's try to you know to give some insights in uh in uh, as many as possible so i think uh, one, uh, some of these points were like websites, e-catalog, packaging, uh, pricing. So let's start, for example, with uh, the website. What are your recommendations to, to make like a retail-ready website so people can start approaching uh, these uh, yeah, definitely. buyers? And definitely. And we will add some, you know, um, websites, for example, um, later on, I'll send you and everything. So here's the thing. Website is your own website. It's your place. It's your game. It's your thing. It's not another extension of Amazon. And why am, am I saying that is because a lot of vendors, and that's what I'm seeing, are making it, you know, naturally something that looks like Amazon. How does it look like Amazon with all the reviews and feedbacks and the five stars, three stars, and so forth? This is, I mean, your website is your website. I appreciate and I know where it comes from and I understand that. But then again, if you want to build your brand, you know, for the future, not just sell on Amazon and that's it, and you want to build it bigger, and at the end of the day, either enjoy it with your family or your sons or whatever it is, daughters, or sell it, 
either way, you want to build a brand. Now, building a brand means that you need actual real branding. Now, here's one very crucial point. It's not the same if I'm selling uh, uh, cups and if I'm selling wipes. Why? Because this is so-called over-the-counter. And this one is houseware or kitchenware, right? And being so... There, is so, there are so many websites out there you can check that they can tell you by the product and by the vibe that you want to transmit, what are the matching colors? That's number one. Number two, there's also websites that are predicting, in most cases they're right, predicting trendy colors. So for instance, for 2022, the prediction last year was, I think, like ceramic uh, uh, colors, okay? Ground color. Okay, kind of light brown or stuff like that and gray. And I am actually seeing that these are the colors that are really in the market, you know, stronger. And obviously it's going to change for 2023. But then colors and a vibe is what you want to see in your website. Another good tip I can give you is rendering. It's not something expensive. There are so many render, uh, 3D rendering, uh, um, you know, VAs that are doing this in like no time. They take your pictures, they build, you know, a short 10 seconds video and think about your website selling whatever, selling a bag, okay? You just sell a bag and that's it. You're showing your bag and it's boring because people have seen bag pictures so many times. While if you do it with rendering, then you, you have someone, you know, either you have it flipping and rounding and showing whatever attributes you have in the bag, or you have a, a, a lady walking down the street with the bag with, you know, cool atmosphere, urban atmosphere, whatever you choose to use. So this is like, you know, small tips about branding, but if you take them and, and develop them, you can, you know, really get a good branding. Right, right. Anyway. That's that's interesting. So obviously, yeah, uh, we need to we need to have great branding in our website and just uh, kind of um, uh, wow the buyers when they see it and the customers, obviously. So we need to give this kind of confidence to to the buyers that we will be able to support them with our good branding, so that people on the shelves they will see the products and you know get excited and buy it. So actually, that uh, leads us to, to uh, one of the next points, which is packaging. I think it's important to, to talk about that because people create their packaging, obviously, to go uh, on, on Amazon, to sell, to be sold on Amazon. But then uh, I think we, we, it could be a good time then to uh, have a, a shift, a mindset shift and, you know, start building, start creating the packaging right off the bat in a retail ready way right so so right. that we don't need to spend more time later on uh, so what, right. what what are the elements that uh of our retail ready packaging so that we, so we can if, create it right away like, yeah so if you sell your products online you don't mind if they are in poly bag or just uh, you know blank white box or even brown box nobody cares because it's online they don't see the packaging but when you walk through uh, into the store and you look at the product and it's in the poly bag then you don't even know what it is or you don't you don't feel like buying it because, right? So then packaging should either be on uh, uh, a box. It depends the product, but normally, yeah. It could be a blister, it's fine. But as long as you have a packaging that if a person, if a, uh, a consumer looks at it, sorry, they know in a second what the product is. If they don't, if you start, you know, uh, using only your logo on that, on that, or a picture that has nothing to do with it, or whatever it is, then you're losing the consumer. Think about like they have, they walk through the store and they have like more than less than a second or two looking at your product and thinking if this is something they want to approach and look and check and buy or not. That's not that's the first option. The second option, and I'm hearing this a lot recently. I just got an email like that last week saying that products are good, packaging is good, but we prefer seeing the, this with a window. Now, what is a window? A window is another 20 or 30 cents on the factory side in China or India or wherever it is, but the, the, the impact is very strong because literally you see the pro product inside that sits inside the box. Okay, so having a transparent window is a very good option. Either way, you just have to think very, very simple that you want to transmit the consumer uh, the idea of what is what is he looking at. 
Okay, so it, it doesn't have to be sophisticated. And obviously you can use, I mean, normally I see that white boxes are something that, you know, white background boxes, this is something that goes very good in retail. But in keep in mind that some of them, at least, you know, the mid to high end retailers, like let's say uh, uh, REI or Bus Pro or companies like that, that sells for quite high prices, they want to have it recyclable material made out of, uh, packaging okay so just keep that in mind but it's not a must i mean most of them would not use would not care about recyclable or not okay okay yeah. that's interesting so guys i think i really recommend everyone to start with the end in mind you know whenever you are going to launch your next products then you know uh, think that at some day at one point you will also uh, might sell that product into retail stores so just so start with creating a, a nice packaging that reflects your your branding that has nice colors maybe it's recyclable maybe has windows like um like a dollar just suggested so just <coughs> make those tweaks right at the, in the beginning so that you're ready to go whenever you, you, it's going to be time to for you to sell right and here's the last tip i normally i wouldn't give that i don't speak about it but i want to give it because it just crossed my mind if you can make your packaging as something that can be reused that's the best on earth because think about someone buying a t-shirt in a box not a t-shirt doesn't make sense but whatever something for the kitchen all right and they open the box and instead of just throwing it you know to the trash to to, to, to the garbage they can put jewelries in that okay there are like you know small walls inside and you can put jewelries or you can use it for the product that you bought or something like that if it's usable packaging and i've seen people doing that this is like wow and this is a wow not only for the retailers this is a wow also for your amazon store why because when a product you know there's a lot of unboxing videos out there in YouTube showing, you know, different products that people bought. And if people would start seeing your packaging that is with reusable uh, uh, packaging, they would, you know, they would yell to the sky how good it is and how they love it. And this is going to make a huge buzz, <clears throat> buzz around your, your brand. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a great tip. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, just made, give me some ideas on how to improve my products as well. Right. So yeah. you, we, we mentioned that, uh, image it, it re, it's really important when approaching uh, uh, retailers we want to show that we look good we we have a good branding so i think uh, the third point that you mentioned before it's uh, it's the e catalog so which is something you know that also shows uh, our brand uh, our product so what what's that about and how should we structure an effective e catalog that then will will grab the attention of buyers so a good e-catalog is actually a kind of reflection of your website, but with, you know, um, different glitches. It has to be PDF. Nobody wants to see Excel or Word. Number two, it has to be well-organized, clean, not with TMI, not too much information. Try to make it, you know, as narrow as you can in terms of like four or five attributes related to the product on the left side or right side. And then the other side, a nice picture of the product, lifestyle images could be well you start with your logo and with your you know slogan at the first page and from second page you have to go down to products you cannot have people looking at a catalog for five pages and not seeing the products because they you know the, there's a limit time think about the, the the psychological side of that there's a limit time of how much they would scroll down not even understanding what they're looking at right just telling them about your company and your family and how it all started they don't care about it they it could be on the last page Page, it's fine but when it comes to the beginning you have to show them slogan what is it all about what we do and boom second page must be product already there okay and again you can change for instance the back the background color each and every page and by that and obviously you can't make you know something that doesn't make sense design wise but by doing so you are creating interest on the other side because they, they are seeing products that are from the same category, but the, the, the fact that the background color is changing every page makes them like more curious without them even knowing that, you know, it's something that happens on the back of the, on the back of the head. Uh, so yeah, you have to keep them curious all the time. Like, oh, 
something changed. You know, it was turquoise and now it's yellow and now it's, you know, green, now it's brown, whatever it is. But the products and the overall uh, uh, structure of the catalog has to be, you know, consistent. So, yeah. For sure, for sure. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, obviously every every psychological um, element, you know, comes into place like in every other uh, situation. So we, with the same for our website, then our e-catalog is the same. We should use uh, our branding in, in a way that, you know, grabs the attention of people. So um, we, we covered a, a three out of six points. Um, uh, you guys will find uh, also um, examples of each of these points in the, in the PDF that we're going to share with you. You will find it in the show notes. Uh, just go to thesellerprocess.com, find this episode, and uh, you can download it in the show notes of this episode or or uh, in the description of the YouTube video, okay? So uh, you, you can go deeper with uh, all these points so you can learn more and uh, also see like real life examples of uh, th that you can use as benchmark basically for like a good looking website, a good looking catalog uh, that Teller it's it's giving to us. Uh, so for for you to uh, you know understand this better. All right. So thank you very much, Taylor. Um, tell people yeah. how they can reach out if they'd like to to uh, your your support in selling and retailers and yeah, how can you help them? Definitely. Well, first of all. Uh... On Facebook, Taylor Offer, T A L O R. I mean, people uh, call me Talor or Taylor is the same, but we spell it T A L O R. That's on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn as well. And obviously, my website, retail empire.com. And there's, um, there's a slide on the left side, um, retail ready service. It's, I mean, I know it's called service, but it's not always that. It's just applying with a form short one that takes like 30 seconds to fill in. And then I'm getting this on email and I can review your product, your line, what's happening. And then we can schedule a call, a zoom call to see if there's, you know, a uh, potential for this particular brand in the retail space. That's how you can reach me out. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much again, Dollar. Guys, Pleasure. remember the key to success is to emulate the best. So, so go implement the tips that Teller just shared with us and, you know, uh, you will be retail ready to, to crash with your business on with, uh, uh, retail stores or a uh, big box retailers. That's a great actually opportunity for you, for you to grow your brand. So I really thank you, uh, again, uh, Teller for sharing these tips okay. and you guys go, go download the, the, um, the, the PDF that the teller just uh, made available for us and uh, and uh, take action. Thank you, Tyler. I hope to see you next time. Thank you so much, Gianmarco. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. Have a good one. Hey, entrepreneurs. I hope you enjoyed the episode and learned something from the interview. If you're serious about creating systems for your business, automating processes and building up your team so that you can transfer the tedious daily tasks in order to focus on more high-level strategic tasks and work on your business and not in your business. I've created a guide for Amazon sellers named Capturing Systems and Creating SOPs that you can find at thesellerprocess.com slash systems ebook, where you will learn how to leverage systems and SOPs in your Amazon business so that you can accomplish more by working less. Optimize your time, automate and delegate tasks, and reap the benefits of being a true business owner and not simply an operator in your own business. Go download the ebook at thesellerprocess.com slash systems ebook and start implementing all the tips and insights that I share with you. And leave us a review or a comment to let us know how, how the content we are sharing here is making an impact in your business. And have a productive week.